this is, I believe, almost all of the 3,500 frames that went into the video. And it got pretty close at the end, and the in terms of the ability to scan all of them in and, and align all the pictures before the release date. And so I think in the last like five or so days, I would just constantly be doing arithmetic in my head of, okay, it takes one minute to scan one frame. If I, so if I work for 12 hours, I can do 12 times 60 minus bathroom breaks, whatever, um, which you really have to get into that kind of nitty gritty uh, if you don't want to get overwhelmed or don't want to you kind of you can't with this with the scanning was it was so was the big in some ways the hardest part of the video even though it was so mechanical uh and i just i barely made it i barely made it but i did make it i finished this was a piece of concept art that was for the school which was one of the early environments i guess the idea of the video was that we would sort of start with more realistic environments or familiar, and then as the heads, as we continue deeper into the, the world of Sonic Boom, we would get more abstract or trippy heads. So uh, this was one of the first ones. And I think the thing that was, these were done so early, one of the main realizations that I had was when I first started designing them, and you can see in this picture, like the world is fairly small, the person inside is gonna be pretty big. It's just like a chalkboard and a couple desks. And then as I did some of the animation tests, I realized that the figure inside the head needed to be like a lot smaller than the overall head to make it feel kind of like it was matching the song in terms of the pace of movement. Uh, that you wanted to feel like you were going faster, uh, which meant that the that the guy inside had to be a lot smaller. So I started making some of these environments in this naive way where I would just have, you know, a couple desks and a chalkboard or whatever. And then once I started putting it to the song, I realized I had to make the environment a lot bigger, which is, you know, so the final video has all these lockers and sort of secondary and tertiary orbital rings uh, that were a process of of adding to the original sets. This was a concept art for the gear heads, uh, which was a environment or world or whatever you want to call it that was particularly important to Pete. I feel like he definitely wanted the gear heads uh, involved in the video. And so you can see in the art and in the final video, this is one of the few heads that doesn't simply bisect, you know, when it opens up, it actually separates into four different levels rather than just cutting in the middle and, and opening up. And that made it a little bit more tricky to place because the way the video is organized and the only way to get it done kind of as quickly as it needed to get done was to make the animation modular such that I animated the camera and head basically once and then applied different environments to it. And you could always, you know, almost always stack any two environments next to each other because the base animation was the same. So you could fade in from any environment to any other environment. The exception being when the head opens in a way that is different than the other parts, which is why it made sense to put this one in the video at the beginning of the second half of the song and have it open in a different way. Uh, and I would have liked probably to have more of the heads open in sort of uh, increasingly Baroque or strange ways. I mean, they do at the very end of the, of the video, but uh, I think that my philosophy for music videos, and I feel like it's, you know, kind of the way things are thought of is that you develop some pattern within the first verse chorus structure. And then 
when the audience sort of is like, okay, understanding that that's the baseline pattern, then it's time to iterate the pattern or to change it in some way that feels organic or natural to the original impetus or conceit, but is actually unexpected. So one way to do that is to, you know, it's like, okay, well, the head's open in some weird way. They, they start off the video bisecting. It would have been cool to be like in the second half of the video, each one of the worlds opens in some totally weird way. Um, but you know, would have, would have added a lot of time, but we did get that one in there. So in this picture, you can see the kind of hand processing that was happening for the second chorus or what I'm calling the chorus. The song don't really, doesn't really break down into verse choruses, but it kind of has two different parts and there's a part where it goes into the head and there's parts where it spins around the head. Um, so there were two different sections, and this is the hand processing uh, of the second. So the frames for the video would get printed out inverted uh, with inverted colors, and there were a couple reasons. I think the first reason to do that is just that because the video is fairly dark or is like really takes place mostly in the darkness, it you save a tremendous amount of money in printer ink simply by printing it out inverted. Um, because there's far, far, far less ink on the page. And then the other secondary reason is that when you load up a printer page with ink, it tends to warp and sort of uh, the, the page doesn't lie flat anymore. So by inverting it, use less ink, and that also preserves the paper. And then the idea with these kind of chorus sections is to slowly introduce the hand processing elements that would be uh, I guess finalized or reached their climax in the in the final section of the video. So each go round of the head, there's a new kind of handmade thing happening. Uh, and this was this was actually no, this was probably the third chorus because in the first one nothing happens; it just goes around the head. So what this was was alcohol ink uh, on stacks of paper, and and the stacks are set up to be as long as each word uh, in the chorus. So you just count the out the frames in Premiere, whatever, and then you have a stack of that pile that uh, that is going to have that word on it. And what's cool about the ink is that when you stack the paper in order, the ink will bleed through to the various levels of paper uh, in order, and then when you scan it back in, those stains will appear and disappear in a in an animated way because what the what's actually being recorded is some is in some ways time is replacing the third Z dimension of the stack of paper, and the stain that bleeds through to multiple levels has actually like a three dimensional object. Um. And the other thing that was funny was because this was made during the pandemic, everywhere ran out of isopropyl alcohol. You couldn't get any isopropyl alcohol, which was used as the dilution agent to kind of spread the the ink splotches. Um, so I had to use Everclear, uh, which probably maybe worked a little too well. I could think that, honestly, it diluted the ink more than the 70% isopropyl alcohol.